Vector Calculus, Important Concepts. I think this is going to be a very short video, and all I want to do is just finalize our whole discussion on vector calculus and vectors and cover some important concepts that I think you'll need moving into electromagnetics. The first concept is flux. Flux sounds like it came from electromagnetics. However, flux is really a mathematical concept. It's really just the sum of a vector field that is punching straight through some surface. Now, in electromagnetics, those fields will be electric fields and magnetic fields, and, and flux will add up to be something physical. But really, it's a mathematical concept. And there's a few important things that we need to think about. Flux only accepts the component of a vector that is punching straight through a surface. So on this slide, we see a yellow surface, so that will be our surface S. And the blue arrows would be the field that we're trying to calculate flux from. And of course, just for illustration purposes, I have the orientation of that field sort of dancing around. The green arrows are showing the components of the blue arrows punching straight through the surface. So in fact, when we're calculating flux, it's those green arrows that we're integrating across the surface. The transverse components of the blue arrows I'm, having, I'm showing here as the red arrows, that part gets completely ignored by the flux calculation. So it's possible to have zero flux and still have a strong field. That field might be parallel to the surface. If the field is punching straight through the surface, that's when we have the maximum flux. So flux is adding up the field, but just the component of the field that's punching straight through the surface. That's flux. Stokes theorem will come up and we will use this to convert back and forth between a closed contour line integral that we're showing on the left and a surface integral. And what I want to do here is just try to give you a way to picture this so Stokes theorem makes some sense. So if we look at the equation on the left, this is a closed contour line integral, meaning we're performing a line integral but we integrate all the way around and we end where we started. If it didn't end where it started, it would not be a closed line integral. It would still be a line integral, but not a closed line integral. This differential length dl, it's a differential length and it's always exactly tangential to the surface that we're integrating around. So when we have this vector field f, and we integrate f dot dl, what this means is we're only interested in the component of f that is tangential or in, in the same direction as this path that we're integrating. And so I'm sort of trying to convey that with these blue arrows here. We're only listening to the component of f that's in the same direction as the line itself. If f is punching straight through the surface, that would be ignored by a line integral. Okay, now in some strange way, that line integral, which is somewhat easy to understand, is now a surface integral of the curl of F and then a dot product with DS. Uh, what does that mean? Well, here's the classic way to visualize this. So we have this dot product with DS. This is a little differential surface. So we can imagine taking this closed line and now we're looking at the area in the in the in between the line in the middle of it and we can divide that up into a whole bunch of little we can think of them as differential areas they're pretty large the way i've drawn it but you know we can imagine having more and more of those little areas and we want to integrate first the curl of f so we're looking at the tendency of f to be rotating right rotating in each one of these little areas well if we think about it Along this line, the rotation would be upward, and then along the line on the adjacent area, that rotation will be downward. And in fact, those two will end up canceling. And in fact, it cancels on all interior points 
The only place that it doesn't cancel, because it has nothing to cancel with, are the edges of these differential areas along the edge where it's not next to another differential area. And so in the limit as we do that, the only thing we're left with is the circulation going around the outside of this surface. So that's sort of the hand-waving way to show Stokes' theorem that, yeah, this closed contour line integral is sort of the same as this surface integral where we're integrating the curl of F. A related theorem that always comes up at the same time, but it's called the divergence theorem. And now we have a closed contour surface integral and we're saying that is the same as a volume integral where we integrate the divergence of F. So I'm going to try to draw a similar picture to intuitively explain why the divergence theorem is true. So we have F dot DS. Well, this is our flux, right? So we're interested in the component of F that's punching straight out of the surface. If these are coming out at an angle, we ignore that component that is tangential to the surface. We're only interested in the component of F that's pointing straight through it. And it's a closed surface integral. So in other words, our surface is perfectly enclosing some volume and we're integrating the flux of F. Well, that's the same as a volume integral where we're integrating the divergence of F. Let's look at what this might look like. So I'm just showing a cross section of a volume and I've divided it up into a bunch of little differential volumes. And so you can imagine making more and more of these and they're becoming smaller and smaller. But if I look at any one and if I've calculated the divergence F inside this little differential volume, well, that's the tendency of F to be diverging or punching straight out of this little differential volume. And of course, if I add all that up, if I look at this field, it punches out of one and into the other. And so it ends up canceling. And in fact, it cancels on all of these interior points. So what we're left with is just the components of F punching straight out from this volume all the way around. So a closed contour surface integral is the same as a volume integral if we're integrating the divergence of F. This is a fun one. And this is a general vector identity. And it says the curl of the gradient of any scalar function always has to be zero. It's impossible to have it otherwise. Let's think about why this is. Well, first, the gradient of F always points in a direction that F increases. So if this was not equal to zero, then certainly the gradient could not be zero. And that's telling us that this F is always increasing. Del cross something is the tendency of this something to form rotation, to circulate about a point. Well, if this were not equal to zero, that would mean that the vector function, which is the gradient of F, would be forming loops. And since the gradient is non-zero, that would be telling us that the function F is increasing all the way around those loops. So we have to ask ourselves, how does a vector function form a loop and always increase? That's sort of impossible. And in fact, this was the topic of a, a very famous artist, Escher. And I love this drawing because I think it explains this vector identity very well. So Escher drew a staircase that I guess is either always going down or always going up. So it, let's say it's always increasing and yet it comes around on itself. But of course it's impossible. So we can't have a function that's always increasing and yet form a complete loop. It has to start where it stopped, which means it can't just keep increasing. It either has to not do anything or go up and then go back down again. So in general, the curl of the gradient of any scalar function always has to be zero. And last, we have a product rule for divergence. So the divergence, remember what's in the del operator, it has an x, a y, and a z derivative. So if f 
and vector a are functions of position, neither of them can come to the outside of the divergence calculation. And in fact, there's some product rule at work here. And here is the product rule. And this is not necessarily intuitive. So I have the proof here, the derivation of that product rule. So the first thing we'll do is expand f times a. So a just has an x, a y, and a z component. I could have expanded this in any coordinate system. I chose Cartesian here. Then we'll apply the divergence. So that means the partial derivative with respect to x times the x component of what was in here, plus the partial derivative of y operating on the y component, plus the partial derivative of z operating on the z component. Now I can apply the ordinary product rule. So I do that for each term and I end up here. Then I can rearrange things. I'll notice that some of these terms had an F out front. So I can group all those terms together and bring the F out to the front here. And I notice all the other terms collected into this form. And if I stare at this long enough, here's what we can see. Inside this first parenthesis, this is just the divergence of the vector function a. And then, of course, the f is out front, so it's f times the divergence of a. And if I look at the second expression, I realize that is just the dot product of a times the gradient of f. And so, of course, these two terms are the two terms that we're showing over here in our product rule. So we derive the product rule, and otherwise, I think this is a very unintuitive identity, and we will use this later on in the electromagnetics class.